Hello and welcome to Forever Rugby on Forever Sports. And today we're going to be talking about the crisis in SA Rugby. And I think it's an interesting conversation because whilst our men's 15s, the Springboks, are probably arguably in the healthy position they might ever be, the rest of the SA Rugby structures are suddenly looking very, very far off the mark. And um, the Blitzbox recent performance on, uh, yesterday in the uh, Olympics in the first round where they are hanging on by a thread sort of really brings to, to attention just how much we've slipped off um, across the seven circuit, for example. You look at the under-20s. They just had their worst ever under-20 championship. Um, you know, if you look at our women's rugby, for example, which is really growing and, and taking big steps, but so far behind the rest of the world. I think it's been an interesting one because I think we've been almost sort of uh, seduced by the success of the Springboks to believe that South Africa rugby as a whole is in a really healthy place, where that might not be the case. Let's get into it, shall we? So, uh, over the last one month, we've seen some of the good and the bad and the ugly for uh, SA Rugby. The good being the Springboks, uh, you know, 1 1 against Ireland. Frustrating because I think we could have won that second test, but um, still, three out of four so far in, in the year. Um, still looking really good, looking to build depth, and, um, you know, no reason really to be panicking or to be really upset about the Springboks. Some people are, I just don't think there's really a valid reason to be. Um, however, let's look a little bit more broadly at the sort of the SA rugby uh, landscape. And the big one, obviously, recently has been the SA under 20, you know, the baby box who generally come sort of top four in, in the under 20 championship most times. Okay, bronze medal last year, which even that felt a bit disappointing. Um, this is a side that's only won the under 20 championship once, but, uh, you know, p uh, periodically make the, the, the playoffs, for example, or well, the quarterfinals, semifinals, um, and get through. To, to the latter stages of, of the competitions. Um, and that was not the case this year. This year, we did not even make the quarterfinals. So, for example, you look back at um, the under 20 across the last how many years, and uh, we've been in a third place match in, I think it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of the last um, 10, 10 matches in the last instance, but this is going back to 2008. And the years we weren't, we were in the final. So there was only the last time we weren't in a, a third place match before this year, uh, we finished out of the top four was 2011. So that really shows you how much the, the SM 20s have slipped off this year. And in fact, we didn't even make the quarterfinals, we didn't even make the top eight, let alone the top four, which is the first time since 2011. Um, so lots of alarm bells there, warranted alarm bells. And, uh, you know, we're a side that's it's come third nine times, fourth once. Um, runners up once 2014 and winners in 2012. We are one of the most successful sides. We've got the most top fours uh, joined with England since the competition has been uh, created and yet finished seventh this, 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 this year. Our worst ever finish. Um, before that, our, our worst finish was fifth back in 2011, as I mentioned. So all of a sudden, you know, despite having the best schoolboys, uh, you know, rugby system in the world, in inverted commas, because something that we really pride ourselves on, the SN 20s are not playing at the level that they should be. And uh, there's lots of reasons to it. I don't think it's simply just a coaching issue. I think that we've got a structural issue where we are not identifying the right players. Um, I think that we've seen it for a long time. Nepotism playing a, long, a, lo a large part in selection with regards to Craven Week, with regards to uh, provincial sides, for example. And it's something we need to relook really look at holistically. It is such a big broad base of players to try and work with. You look at all the school weary players around the country. We've got to find a system which is really identifying the top talent because I don't think um, anyone is looking at that SN20 side and thinking that it really is the top 23 players at that age group in the country. Um, you know, and it's frustrating. It is really frustrating. And it's something that is very fixable. This is the nice thing about, you know, talking about this, and I'm talking about box but as well as women's rugby. The talent is there. You know, we don't have a talent problem. We don't have a, a problem from a schoolboy level. Maybe it's at a women's rugby we do. But the talent is there. What we have now is a disjoint between schoolboy, SN20, Sevens, for example, and, and the rest. So we've kind of got a bit of an issue with the pipeline and the way the pipeline is not working. Um, so that's the first thing we need to try to fix the SN20s. I think we need a lot more attention with regards to um, how selection works, for example, the you know the teams involved with the guards of coaches, the selectors, for example. How do we create a more broad-based system which is identifying more and more talent? How do we harness that talent so that players aren't just you know having two or three bad games all of a sudden never considered again have to kind of work their way back through via like a varsity cup uh, or a course rugby, for example, playing rugby, getting a, you know noticed 
that kind of thing. We need far more opportunities for these players to play. If you look at our Blitzbox system, for example, we've seen the downward spiral, haven't we? You know, yesterday in Ireland, you know, frustrating a yellow card, which was probably the end of it, really losing the Ireland by one try. Looked a bit more competitive against New Zealand, though. We looked really, really poor. Basic mistakes, for example, um, just not clinical enough. And you kind of wonder why. It's it's a lot of players who've been around the block for a while. They've got the talent. They've got the ability, but not putting it together. And I think the Australian thing is that, you know, we've we've seen some new talent come through. Some of it's been really good. Some of it has been subpar. Now, the future of Sevens is an interesting one because the Sevens series has actually been shortened. So there's only about six events now, which means that it's difficult to contract players for what is essentially six weekends a, a, a year. Um... So we need to be look at that. Now, how do we look at this? Now, personally, I think we need to look at a dual contracting system where all these Sevens players are paired with a union like we've seen before. Um, but Sevens has got to be the priority, you know. So it's got to be a case of you get paired with the union so that you sort of, um, uh, I think that SRA we kind of need to almost sort of contract about 10 players, you know, 10 to 12 players in like almost like an elite Sevens program and contract them with the union so that they are actively playing and keeping fit, for example, keeping sharp. But as soon as it comes around to Olympic prep, for example, World Cup prep series, they get released. And that's not even a, 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 a second thought about it. Um, I, I think that's the only way for me I can see this really um, getting better. Because I think there's just not enough sevens rugby to play. You know, you play like Africa games, for example, every now and again. But we generally send like a youth team. Same thing as, you know, the Africa sevens championship. We, you know, we generally send youth teams. So there's not a lot of sevens rugby to be played. Now, until that changes... Um, and we have seen a couple of, um, you know, standalone tournaments popping up. We saw that one in the States a couple of years ago. Um, we're going to continue to have this issue. I also think we need to look at, you know, for example, we've seen how in the past we had these players who were playing 15s moving back into the seven circuit for specific events. Now, whether we need to be able to do that, I'm not sure. You know, Anthony Pond, for example, is taking to, to sevens like a duck to water. has been really, really good. Hugh Keenan looked really good in an Irish show yesterday. Uh, Mark Nwangani Tawase has maybe had a slower start. But... I do think we need to look at a sharing of, re of resources because we need to make sure that come the Olympics, come the Sevens World Cup, come the Commonwealth Games, you know, that, that's that's three tournaments that happen every four years, which means that almost every single year there's a major Sevens tournament. And we need to be able to to move and, 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 and rely on players, you know, like, a for example, Angelo Davids playing with the Stormers. How much value would he have added to the Sevens side? JC Pretorius, you know, for the Lions. How much value would he have added to the Sevens side right now in the Olympics? You know, and if he was sitting there on a dual contract where, you know, for example, he, you know, at the end of the, the URC season, he, bam, cool. Into the seventh set, he goes, he gets them like six weeks back with the blitz box and he can go to the Olympics. Now, it's a frustrating thing. I maybe I think, you know, from a series of Kelly point of view, you've got these players who come through and, you know, they sort of uh, harness and then they kind of get replaced. But at the end of the day, we're talking about the elite game and we need to make sure that when we go to the Olympics, you know, which is the, the creme de la creme of, of sporting events, uh, Olympic gold is the best thing you can win as a Sevens player. I'll be, let's be honest, I think a Sevens player would rather win an Olympic gold than maybe a Sevens World Cup or a Sevens Series Series, you know? Olympic gold is, 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 is that for me, the pinnacle of Sevens rugby. And we're not getting to the stage where we're taking the best players over there. Um, you know, now, Quack Smith, for example, is a little bit different. You know, obviously playing for the Springboks, you kind of then going, mm, mm, mm. but even that situation, if you had a Quack Smith, a Chase and Colby, you know, going back into the Sevens circuit, they were playing for the Olympics, you'd think it would be a whole different side um so it is something that needs to be we looked at and then we've got our women's rugby which i'm never gonna i'm never gonna take shots at the women's players themselves because we have got one professional union in the country the bulls daisies are sort of trailblazing their way in in women's rugby because they are a professional outfit and you look at the scores they're putting on against some of the other teams it shows you Women's rugby has been neglected for far far too long and uh, they're punched by their weight actually we're currently ranked 12th in the world and at the end of the day, sport is not complicated. Sport requires money and investment. And not just financial investment, but mainly financial investment, but investment in structures, investment in coaches, investment in programs. Canada is ranked 21st in the men's game and are ranked third in the women's game. USA is ranked 19th in the world for the women in the men's game, but ranked seventh in the women's game. Investment means growth and we've got such good talent in this country we've got such um athletic people um and players that i don't think it would be difficult for us to become a top 10 top five even women's side in the world um you know we've seen how in a short space of time we have managed to move up the rankings 
you know, if you go back, um, you know, you don't have to go back very, very far to sort of see how we were almost sort of nowhere. Um, you know, and uh, it's it's been a frustrating thing where we just haven't really seen more and more programs coming in to try and develop this 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 uh, this team. You know, that's very much where we see it's the only time we we're seeing, for example, our best players playing sevens as well as fifties very regularly. You know, Nadine Ruiz, uh, Libby Janssen from Rendsburg, for example, um, players like that playing going from the sevens to the fifteens, probably back to the fifteens now after the sevens, um, because you know we just have a, a, we we just don't have the amount of of, of depth. That we need in a women's game, and this is like a structural issue. You know, I mean, look at South Africa women's cricket. We've played in the T Twenty World Cup final, by the way. We did that before the men's did it, and that sort of shows you how, if you put the structures in place and you invest, South Africa will produce. We've got, I will say, and, and people can take shot at me, but I will say, I, we inherently a very sporting nation. We've got so much athletic talent. We've also got so many people, really, sixty million people to pick from. You know, the same amount as a, a UK, for example, far more than an island um, and a New Zealand and Australia. So we need to make sure that we are harnessing this talent because I reckon, I still think if you invest into the talent properly, we can become a top top side in, in, in the world. Somebody was, was saying on Twitter, and I actually put a whole thread on Twitter about this, what we're talking about now. And someone was saying they don't feel that the Black Ferns from New Zealand ever get actually that much intention and that much, and that much uh, investment. And yet they're the best team in the world by a long measure. I think it goes to show you that we don't. Have, I mean, you don't. You don't actually have to um, invest springbok levels of money into the women's system to be able to grow it. But we cannot have one professional team. We've got to have six, four, five, six professional teams. We need to have a women's curry cup of professional players, players who are paid to play, players who wake up, eat, sleep, breathe rugby. That is what they are there to do. Because far too many of these players are, you know, have got part time, have got jobs, you know, full time jobs, and then they, you know, go to rugby practice in the evenings, and then they have to like fly on a Friday night to play on a Saturday, get back because they're going to be in their ops on Monday. We're never going to grow as a nation in the women's game if this is the case. Until we professionalize more of our unions, get more of our players playing overseas, for example, we've got players playing over in the Harlequins and playing in the, in, in the UK in the Premiership, in the women's Premiership. That's kind of the, the, what were the kind of moves we need. Until that gets done, we're going to continue to struggle. So I think the main thing is, and it's not a reason to be negative, you know, but we've got to be very honest, I think. And I think that's the main thing. We've got to be honest about the fact that SA Rugby, in general, holistically, is not in the best place. We've got a really good spring box side, and that's going off really well. And twins are struggling. The blitz box are struggling. Women's rugby is struggling. And until we get that right, even our unions, I think, you know, financially, they're also struggling in terms of what's going to happen in the future. How do we become competitive in the URC, the EPCR? How do we become financially viable, for example? How do we continue building the crowds um, that we're starting to see? You're starting to get there slowly, um, but not, to, not not the end of the road by any means. Um, so those are, I think, a lot of the pressing issues. And I think we need to maybe take a step back and say, as much as we want to celebrate the Spring Box, and we will, and we, you know, we love chasing the sun, we don't want that to become, um, you know, deflective. We don't want that just to be uh, a, a, a facade of SRA is so phenomenal, where in actual fact, we've got an underfunded women's program. We've got a blitz box side, which is not uh, performing to the, the best of their ability. We've got an SM20 side, which is slipping into, into the abyss. So lots to do, lots to talk about. And I think this is something that we as fans have got to hold SRA accountable about. You know, we cannot let them just parade the spring box around and expect us to be happy with what's going on when we're seeing that uh, the SM20s aren't performing as they should be, that the Blitzbox aren't performing as they should be, that the, the women's sevens isn't performing as they should be, the women's fifteens is 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 not getting the funding and the and the attention that they deserve. We as fans, you know, are the I mean, so SRB are the custodians, we have to hold them to account. You know, we are the sort of the checks and balances. We have to make sure that SRB as the custodians of rugby in South Africa are, are being held to account across the board. And if we're not happy with that, we need to make sure our, 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 we need to make sure our voice is heard and put pressure on SRB to get these things right. You know, get the junior structures right, get the women's rugby structures right, get the seven structures right. We can become a rugby powerhouse. You look at Ireland, for example, who have just put in a lot of investment. And look, the women's game is a lot of there's there's a lot of um, um, I talk about how that's not maybe reminiscent as well as it should be over in Ireland, but they currently rank fifth in the world in the women's game. Uh, sorry, actually, I lie. They are. Uh, they're coming down tenth, and they're worth it. That should, draw, but um, their se- men's side are currently second. They their seventh side, which has not been going for that long, is um, came second in the World Series, and are a potential Olympic medal, for example. And so, if you look at Ireland, for who have become 
they've always been a strong rugby nation, but now we're almost becoming a bit of a rugby powerhouse because of the structure they're putting in place, particularly in the men's structures, not so much in the women's, but in the men's structures. You see how that seven sides come along, the 15 side, for example. We should never be comparing ourselves to Ireland because we've got a much bigger player base, a much bigger, um, you know, much bigger structures, much better structures at certain levels. So if we can get that right, I don't think anybody can stop us as a rugby nation, but we're not getting a lot of it right. So we need to get more of it right. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. Smash a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel as well. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Steve. I'll chat to you soon.